Now, as soon as we had moved into our apartment in Peru, where we lived before we came to Kansas, we set about trying to get to know our neighbors. And there, it, was, it was easy enough because they seemed like pretty nice folks, and we'd bump into each other on the way out and on the way in. And we lived at the back of this little courtyard, so it was kind of everyone was funneled back there, and we'd see each other and talk to each other. And, and you know... Um, it was it seemed seemed great, you know. We were missionaries. We were trying to live out our calling, and we figured if we're going to talk to our people about our faith in Jesus, then we have to get to know them as our neighbors and befriend them. And 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 that that was going along just fine, until they decided to add on another floor to their building. And you see, in the Cusco Valley, land is so precious that everybody's building right up next to each other. We were living cheek to jowl with them, and their, their building literally touched our building. And we had this little green space in the backyard where our boys would like to go out there and, and play, and we had a couple of garden plants growing there. It was kind of our little escape from the, the hurly-burly of the city. And one day, stones and liquid cement and cement dust started to rain down on us from their building. And they were knocking down our plants, and stones were landing in the yard, and the boys ran inside, and we wouldn't let them go out anymore because it turns out that befriending your neighbor is all fine and well until they drop stones on your kids' head. Well, look, we were not just trying to befriend them as a strategy of sharing the gospel. We were also trying to befriend them because we knew Jesus' words that the greatest commandment is to love God and the second commandment is to love your neighbor. And there they were. They were our neighbors and we wanted to love them and get to know them. We wanted to live this out. Love your neighbor. Now, in this commandment that Jesus cites, love your neighbor, Um, he's quoting the Old Testament. And and he calls us to love God, and he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy when he says that. He's quoting the law of Moses. And when he calls us to love our neighbor, he's quoting the book of Leviticus, which is again in the law of Moses. And, you know, I think uh, oftentimes we have a tendency to want to write off the Old Testament or write off the, the law. Jesus didn't. Jesus went to the Old Testament scriptures for guidance. He sought out the heart of the scriptures, God's intention, God's desire in those scriptures, the the beating heart of the whole scripture. And there is what he found love. He centered in on that love of God and love of neighbor. And the context of our passage this morning is really important because this passage comes in a whole series of tests that the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the experts in the law, all these people who knew about the ancient scriptures in Jesus' day, they they put these tests to Jesus. So back in chapter 11, they they ask him where his authority comes from. It's his test. Where's your authority from? Then in chapter 12, they ask if they ought to pay taxes. Then they ask him about the resurrection. And then they come to him and they say, all right, you've answered these questions, so how about this one? What is the greatest commandment? And what's interesting is that each time when those teachers of the law bring a kind of an abstract challenge to Jesus, Jesus turns it around and he gets very concrete and very specific. Jesus doesn't want to bandy words with them, bandy words with them. He doesn't want to just talk philosophy. He's not interested in just thinking about people out there. Jesus always wants to bring it back to how we live as human beings. And so when they ask him about where his authority comes from, Jesus turns it around and he gets very concrete and he says, well, where did John's authority come from? And when they ask him if they should pay taxes, Jesus turns it around and gets very concrete and he says, should you pay taxes? Well, bring me a coin whose head is on that coin. And when they ask him about the resurrection and the woman who, whose husband dies and she marries in seven times succession, the brothers... They they ask about the resurrection, and Jesus turns it around and gets it concrete and says, you don't understand what the resurrection is is really like. And so I think essentially what Jesus is doing is saying each time that this is not about making an analogy. It's not about just talking about some idea out there. This is about the reality of God's life and commandments and power, 
It's about human life before the living God. And I think that's what Jesus does here too. When they ask him about the greatest commandment, Jesus says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. It's love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not abstract. It's very concrete. It's not love humanity in the abstract. It's not love people in the abstract. It's not love the whole world in the abstract. It is love your neighbor. You know, it's Valentine's season, so just a little fun. Love you, neighbor. And we've got such great neighbors. We, they keep moving away, but I don't know if, I don't know if that's our issue or what. But um, love your neighbor, right? And I think this is so important. I think this is so important. I think the word choice that Jesus uses there is very intentional, very important. Neighbor. He says, love your neighbor. And he's drawn this out of the scriptures, out of the, the ancient law, where it says, love your neighbor. And Jesus repeats it. He says, love your neighbor. And I wonder, it's so important. I wonder, can we just, can we just say the word neighbor together? Neighbor. Can we say, love your neighbor? Love your neighbor. So Jesus says, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the second most important commandment. And what this means is that as much as God calls us to love humanity, to love people, to love the world in the abstract, I think where that love starts is not in an abstract commitment or feeling, but in the very concrete love for our neighbor. This is why writer and activist Dorothy Day once said, once said that there, there's plenty to do for each one of us working on our own hearts, changing our own attitudes in our own neighborhoods. So that love begins with, our, with, with changing our own hearts, with our own attitudes, with our own neighborhoods, our own neighbors. You know, the word for neighbor in the scriptures, it's pretty straightforward. It means those who are nearby. It means those who are close. It means those who we're going to bump into on a day-to-day -day basis. That is where our love for other human beings has to start, with the neighbors, with the people around us, with the people in our community. And just, just to be clear, Jesus isn't saying that we don't have to have love for faraway people. He's not saying that the plight of Syrian refugees doesn't need to matter to us or that we don't have to love people in Vanuatu or Bangladesh whose islands are disappearing because of climate change. Jesus is not saying just love your own tribe. But what I think Jesus is teaching is that love for humanity, love for people, love for the world starts with love for neighbor. We don't love humanity in the abstract. We love neighbors called to love real, concrete people who are near us. They, they, they're going to have quirks. They're going to have their own prickly personality sometimes. Jesus is saying sometimes you're going to have to love people who are unlovely. Jesus is saying, love that guy across town who voted for the other candidate. Jesus is saying, love those who you don't see eye to eye with. Love those who are different. Jesus is saying, Love even those neighbors who are raining down stones and concrete on top of you. You see, real loving of really uh, of real honest to goodness neighbors is much harder than loving people in the abstract. You know, I think it's easier to love people in the abstract, to love categories of people, than it is to love real people. It's easier to say things like, I care about, you know, pick your category. I care about people on the margins. Until we meet a person on the margins who comes with all sorts of real-life human struggles and doesn't make the same choices that we might make. You know, it's easy to say we, we care about immigrants or refugees or persecuted Christians or farmers or rural people or kids in the inner city but when we meet these folks in these categories, things start to get more complex. You know, it's often easier to love people categorically than it is to love them in the flesh and blood. I remember, um, you know, we care about people who don't have a place to live. We care about homeless people. And I remember we took some, some of our youth in Washington over to Seattle, and we were helping out with the, the homeless shelter, the homeless um, 
kind of a day shelter that the Seattle Mennonite Church runs, and we were doing some some work over there, and I remember we were cleaning windows and cleaning up the house while some homeless folks were just hanging out, and I had this, this, this is terrible, it's mea culpa, right? But I remember having this feeling as I'm washing the windows, I'm like, why, am I, why did I drive over here to clean the windows? Like, they could have done it, right? Um, and that's not the right attitude, but what it illustrates is that it's easy to love, say, homeless people in the abstract until you're the one cleaning their windows, and you might have different feelings about it all. It's easier to love people categorically than it is to love them flesh and blood. Neighbors are real. Neighbors have hopes. Neighbors have dreams that might be very different from our own. Neighbors are people. And people are more difficult to love than categories. But you know, the same kind of goes for the opposite, for disliking people, right? I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's easier to say, I don't like, and then to fill in the blank until you meet those people. It's so easy to say, I don't like liberals, or I don't like Trump voters, or I don't like Muslims, or I don't like the media. You know, hating people in the abstract is easy, but then when we meet real flesh and blood people, things get a little bit more complicated. Or at least they ought to. Because, you know, there's this human tendency to want to put people into boxes. We want to say, well, you're conservative or you're liberal, so you believe X, Y, Z, and I know who you are, and I don't don't even want to deal with you. But that is not loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's just writing them off. That's not seeing them as flesh and blood human beings, as neighbors who are parents and friends and caregivers, That's just taking them for TV projections. Jesus calls us to love our neighbors, which means taking people as they come, warts and all, and votes and all. No matter where you're from or who you voted for, we're glad you're our neighbor. Love your neighbor. And the thing is, the way Jesus sees it, neighbors aren't just people who happen to move in next door. It starts with that proximity, but then it expands outward. Neighbors aren't just the people that we happen to have around us. I mean, it is those people, but it's more than that. Who is my neighbor? And you know, that's, that's a question, of course, that someone put to Jesus one time. It's kind of like our passage in the Gospel of Mark. Someone came to Jesus and asked him to interpret the scriptures and talk about life and It was this expert in the law who tested Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what do the scriptures say? And the man responded, the scriptures say, love God and love neighbor. And Jesus said, you're right, do this and you will live. End of story. But the man wished to limit who he'd need to love a little bit and kind of create a, you know, build a fence around the categories that he'd have to reach out to. And he said, well, who's my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told this story. You know it well. Jesus told this story about a man who was robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. And the people who should have been his neighbor walked by on the other side and didn't stop. And the Samaritan, the guy who we wouldn't expect to be his neighbor, stops and helps. That's what we call the story of the good Samaritan. It's found in Luke chapter 10. And what's so beautiful about that story is that Jesus says at the end, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. And part of what Jesus is saying is that being a neighbor isn't something that just happens to us. Being a neighbor is something we choose to do. We neighbor people. It's a verb. We, we show mercy to them, and when Jesus instructs us to love our neighbors, it's not just this passive thing, it's this acting, active reaching out to connect with folks. That the question isn't just who happens to be next door, the, the question really becomes who can I be a neighbor to? And you know, I think, I think the art of neighboring is probably one of the most important pieces for us to live out as a rural, small-town church especially when we encounter someone new, the question is really whether we can reach out into um, 
connect to them? Can we be a neighbor to them? Because in rural communities, we have the privilege and sometimes the challenge of knowing each other over long periods of time. So how do we reach out to folks, especially when they are the new neighbors? It's easy to only neighbor the past, to remember who lived in the house next door 50 years ago, but not to know who lives there now. It's kind of like when people say, well, you, you live in the old Crable house, right? But don't know who lives there now. I think the depth of our life in the community is going to be measured by how we neighbor others. Love of neighbor is what's going to set us apart. Love of neighbor is what's going to show forth the truth of the gospel. Love of neighbor is what's going to get us an open door to share our faith in Jesus. I think that love of neighbor is really one of the ways that we ought to be measuring our growth as a rural church. How well have we loved our neighbor? I talked to a pastor in a tiny little town way up in Saskatchewan, Canada, and she and her husband pastor a couple of churches together, and in one of their churches, pretty much the only, or one of their communities, pretty much one of the only restaurants and uh, gathering places in town was this, this bar down on Main Street, and the, the roof on the bar started to leak, and the owner got sick with cancer and got herself into some financial difficulties, and so the church did kind of an amazing thing. In this little town up in Saskatchewan, this single bar downtown, the church did something kind of amazing. They decided to get together and fix the roof on the bar for her. Now, when this pastor told me the story about how their local Mennonite church fixed the roof on the bar, I, I thought this was interesting. Kind of trying to imagine this all, right? And I said, you know, I, I was trying to round out the rough edges a little bit. And I was like, well, when, Pastor, when you say bar, what you really mean is like local restaurant. You're just kind of speaking Canadian to me, right? And um, she's like, no, it's pretty much what you would think of when you think about a bar. It was dark and dingy, but we fixed the roof on it. And the owner of the bar wasn't their family member. She wasn't a church member. She wasn't more deserving than anyone else, but she was their neighbor. Jesus said, love your neighbor. Being neighbors to one another ultimately leads us to what the New Testament calls koinonia. And that's a Greek word that means communion. It's a word that means being together. And that togetherness happens because of Christ. Koinonia, communion, is what the early church cultivated around the Lord's table and in each other's living rooms in Acts chapter 2. Koinonia is the communion that Paul talks about being formed at the Lord's table. Koinonia is the, fellow, the friendship and the fellowship that begins in God, extends through the church, and opens out into the world. That's the koinonia. And this koinonia communion is utterly useless. It has no further use, no end, no purpose beyond being together in Christ. And that's the thing. That's what loving our neighbors is about. It, loving our neighbors is about loving our neighbors. It's not a strategy for success. It's not a way to earn salvation. It doesn't get us favor with God. Loving our neighbor is simply about loving our neighbor. Ultimately, loving our neighbor is what God did in Jesus. The scriptures say that the word put on flesh and walked among us, and that is that is exactly what God did. God came into the world in love. God neighbored the world in Jesus. We have become God's neighbors. God neighbored us first. And it doesn't mean that God agrees with us on everything or that God doesn't see all the ways that we sin and fail. I mean, listen, God has the most clear-eyed view of who all of us are. But in spite of all that, while we were yet sinners, God has become our neighbor in Jesus Christ. And God expects us to do the same. 
This is why Jesus taught, as I have loved you, so you should love one another. This is why in 1 John, love of neighbor is the test of Christ being in us. This is why Paul wrote in Romans that love does no wrong to neighbor and is the fulfilling of the law. This is why Jesus was born and lived and taught and died nailed to that cross because of love of us, his neighbors. Love your neighbor. So those neighbors in Peru who were dropping stones and cement on us, well, we went over and we talked to them a couple times. And they ended up hanging this cloth around the edge of the building and around their construction site, and it was not a perfect solution. We still would not let the boys play out there when they were working up on the building. We still had a stone or two that would randomly bonk down on our awning, but we mostly worked it out for them. You know, loving our neighbors is not always easy, but it's the challenge of following Jesus. I think loving neighbor takes a lifetime to learn, but love is the way of Jesus. It's the way of life. Love fulfills the law. Love is what remains when all the rest has fallen away. Think about what Paul said. Faith, hope, and love abide, he wrote. But the greatest of these is love. Love your neighbor. Amen.